Okay, right, that put aside, uh, we've got a really interesting talk tonight from Heli. Um, we've known Heli for some years now. Uh, I'm not going to mention how long. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I recall Ellie now lives in Kongsbury, but she used to live in Yatton beforehand. So she knows the two communities very well. And she does know our reserves as, uh, as well as that. Um, and I recall at one time, um, I think we really first met walking down the strawberry line because we were doing a little bee survey. And I can't remember how long ago that was, but I think you did um, do a bee survey in uh, our Stowey Reserve, which was yeah, that would have been maybe seven or eight years ago, I think. I must have yeah, done that. yeah, that, that's right. Unfortunately, um, you missed the yellow loosestrife bee, but oh, <laughs> yeah. If you'd like to see that this year, then let me know. I so would. I'd like to go and have a look around the Stowey yeah, Reserve again. Yeah. Actually, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, let's do that. Well, um. I know, I know you've you, you've um, had a lot of experience with um, grass grassland management, species which grassland and so forth, and you're currently with the Somerset Wildlife Trust as um, a, a farming or a farmer advisor, mm -hmm. and um, all I'd like to say is, the floor is yours and oh. take us through your talk. Thank you very much. Right, I'll just queue up my slides. Um, so, do, 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 do. so uh, as Tony said, I'm Eleanor Higginson and currently I work for the Somerset Wildlife Trust, but I have worked alongside farmers for about 20 years now, um, helping them to farm in a more nature friendly way. Um, so this evening, I'd like to give you a bit of a flavour of what nature friendly farming looks like and what we need to think about when we're talking about um, sustainable food production. So um, I'm going to start off with um, just giving you a bit of an update of what's going on in farming right now, because it's quite um, an uncertain time for farmers. There's a lot of change um, happening in, far in farming. Part of that change is driven by Brexit and the fact that um, leaving the EU has meant that we can now review all the farming subsidies and the agri-environment schemes um, that farmers are able to apply for. But there's also financial pressures as well with the price of inputs kind of going up and up and up. Um, so what we're in at the moment is being called by the government the agricultural transition period. Um, and that basically means that all the schemes are being reviewed and by 2027 we should have a set of shiny new fully operational schemes. Um, <laughs> but um, it's not necessarily turning out how we thought it would do. Um, so I'll give you a bit of a backstory to it. So in, um, in 2018 after Brexit the government released something called the 25 year environment plan. And that was where we first saw this idea of public money for public goods. So that basically means that um, if you're farming and you would like to receive money for the government for farming, you need to be providing what's called public goods. So that's things like um, purifying water, carbon sequestration, flood reduction, access, that, that kind of thing. Um, and that was actually really exciting. Um, and so everyone in farming and in the environmental sector, after that document came out, we all set about feeding into consultations, getting involved in pilots and trials, um, looking at how we can kind of match up these public goods with um, a monetary value. Um, unfortunately, progress in that hasn't been massively overwhelming and um, things were derailed a bit more um, when Liz Trust had her brief period in government, um, but there is some progress. So I'll just go through how the um, available public money is changing and what the kind of emphasis of that money is. Um, so there's a move away from what's called area based payments. Um, so farmers will know that as BPS. So previously, um, farmers could receive a certain amount of money based on the area of land that they had. And that wasn't linked to any particular actions. It was, it was purely an area based payment. What's happening now is that that payment is being reduced. Um, and in place of that, something called the sustainable farming incentive is coming in. Um, and that's basically 
payments related to good farming practice. So um, that will be things like having a plan for what nutrients you're going to put where on your farm and when. So we don't end up with lots of nutrients not being used and going into the rivers. Um, or it's things like having lots of different crops on your farms or looking after your hedges in a particular way. There's also an emphasis um, with the new schemes on a greater level of collaboration between neighbours, between neighbouring farms. And so this is linked to the idea of landscape scale conservation. I don't know if this is something that's come up in other Yakwag talks, um, but it's basically looking at conservation across the whole landscape. So not thinking about sort of small isolated reserves. It's about having bigger areas of habitat um, of better quality, more of them, and crucially having those areas joined up. So having corridors um, that join the different areas or having a landscape that's more hospitable to wildlife. It's easier for wildlife to, to move through. And those, those ideas are being reflected in um, the other layers of the, the new environmental land management scheme. Um, the other thing that's happening in farming is that um, any sort of inputs, so diesel, nitrogen, crop protection products, so like pesticides, herbicides, that sort of thing, the prices for those has skyrocketed. And there is a shift from um, going for high yields, which often requires high inputs. There's a shift away from that to looking at um, profit margins and reducing the inputs that you use on your farm um, and kind of letting natural processes do the work. And I'm going to talk a bit about what those natural processes are in a minute. Um, there's also a move towards um, blending income from public money. So public money, like I said, that's that's the government schemes that we're used to thinking of. Um, they're not called subsidies anymore, but that's what people tend to sort of refer to them widely as. Um, so blending that public money um, with private finance. Um, which is kind of a new fast developing area and private finance often involves things like um you may have heard of carbon credits and things like that so whereby people are planting trees they're creating woodlands those woodlands will sequester a certain amount of carbon um and then each unit of carbon has a has an income connected to it there's also private finance related to um what's called nutrient neutrality um, so there's a lot of issues at the moment with kind of phosphates in water courses and things. And in certain areas, there's payments that can be connected to switching through to different land uses that that release fewer phosphates into the environment. And something else that you might be familiar with is biodiversity net gain. So that's where there's a development and there's going to be a loss of biodiversity. And the developer is responsible for creating habitats nearby. Um, and that has a payment connected to it as well. So farmers are starting to look at lots of different ways of bringing income onto the farm. And if we put all these things together, um, we come up with um, what's called regenerative farming, um, which is basically where you're considering all the natural processes that are going on on your farm and you're thinking about soil health. And those are really hot topics um, at the moment. So I should say at this point, um, questions so I'm going to have a few different sections throughout my talk and I will pause at the end of each one for any questions that you've got if you've got a question then please do unmute yourself and ask it so are there any questions on the agricultural transition period no okay great so let's move on to um the natural processes that I was referring to so basically Nature friendly farming doesn't look like one thing. Every farm is different. But if you're going to be doing nature friendly farming, you need to be considering these natural processes. So there's essentially you've got the nutrient cycle, you've got the water cycle, and you've got interactions between different species. And if you're considering all of those things, somewhere in the middle, you should have sustainable food production. And this, because you don't have to just think about this harvest, you have to think about the harvest in 50 years, in 100 years. And if the nutrients aren't cycling through your soils, if you've got water logging or no water, um, and if you haven't got those species to support what you're doing on your farm, you're going to be in a bit of a pickle. 
So the reason that we need to think about um, natural processes um, is that there is an awful lot of change going on at the moment. So we've got climate change, species distributions are changing, numbers of species are changing. It's hard to say what species or habitat to focus on. Um, and things are quite degraded and fragmented and we need to go back to the foundations. So we need to lift the bonnet and look at the mechanisms of how our environment works. And often technological solutions to problems are expensive, they take time to implement. Um, and if you can restore the ecosystem processes and deliver nature-based solutions, you can often deliver multiple benefits. So let's start with the water cycle. Now, presumably you're all familiar <laughs> with the water cycle, um, or at least I hope you are anyway. So basically I'll just run through it. So the rain falls on the ground, and it either runs off into rivers and seas, or it infiltrates into the ground um, and recharges uh, groundwater, basically. And there's a few different places that it can be intercepted. So um, if it falls on the soil and there's lots of lovely vegetation there, it can sit around for a bit longer, take more time to infiltrate, or it runs off into rivers and seas a lot slower. And then you've obviously got um, the evaporation, which takes it back up to clouds again, or if the water has been used by a plant um, in uh, respiration, then it goes back up through the plant in transpiration. So let's have a look. So how can you tell if the water cycle is not working? So there are a number of clues that you can look for um, to tell you if you've got issues with your water cycle. Um, so one thing is puddles, and that's when the water just sits there on the soil surface. So that's telling you that the infiltration part of the water cycle isn't really working that well. Um, and that can be because of compaction. So by compaction, I'm talking about the structure of the soil. So soil should have a nice open airy structure. So it should be basically like, I don't know, lots of balls in a bean bag or in a ball pool. There should be lots of air gaps and things between the soil particles. And these air gaps leave spaces for roots to grow through really easily. They leave spaces for water to filter through to recharge the groundwater. But if the soil is under a lot of pressure frequently, all the soil particles get squashed together. And so um, water can't move through the soil very easily. And what you often see is you might have um, water accumulating on the surface of the soil. But if you dig down through the layers of the soil, you will find that it's dry. So it's not because the ground is waterlogged or saturated. It's simply because the structure of the soil is not allowing the water to move through it. Um, and ways you can deal with that is you can um, have plants like docks or plantain or trees, plants with really big punchy roots that can punch through that compacted soil and begin to open up those cracks again and begin to aerate the soil. So plants can really help us with compaction. Other clues that the water cycle is not working is if you've got something called soil capping. So that's where you've got areas of bare ground and you get rainfall onto the soil. And every time the rain hits the soil, it sends up lots of fine soil particles and then they sort of get baked like a little crust on the top. Um, and capping is a problem because it means that um, sort of seedlings and things can't break through that cap. So you get problems with germination. Um, and it also causes problems in terms of like the soil surface getting very hot when it's sunny um, and that affects the soil microbes and things like that. So if you've got bare ground and capping, that's telling you that your water cycle is not working that well. Droughts are another clue that your water cycle is not working. So a drought isn't necessarily about a lack of rain, although that does contribute to drought. Um, it's about not having enough water to sustain the plants that should be growing there. So if your groundwater hasn't been recharging through infiltration, then when you get periods of no rain, you will start to see drought conditions um, occurring. And it's quite interesting. So the last summer that we had that was um, very, very hot, very, very dry. Obviously, you could see in the fields, that some fields are drying up, others weren't. When I was going around surveying, 
if I was surveying a field that perhaps just had ryegrass in it, so a ryegrass lay, that, and the grass in those fields has got very, very shallow roots, it's just ryegrass, maybe with a bit of clover, those fields are really drying up. But if I was out surveying fields that had um, wild flowers in them, so things like knapweed and plantains and things that got really deep roots that were able to get down to the groundwater, those plants were doing really, really well. And also there's a type of temporary grass that can be used on farms called a herbal lay. So that's um, a temporary uh, grass crop that also includes things like sandfoin and clovers and chicory and has a really varied set of plants with varied root structures. And those were doing much better in the droughts that we saw um, this summer. Another sign that your water cycle isn't working um, is floods. So when it rains, if you've got lots of vegetation on the surface and if you've got lots of infiltration, so if the water's going into the soil, you will find that the water runs off the soil a lot more slowly. So all the vegetation that you've got on the surface, so things like trees, grass, hedges, you name it, it slows down that flow of water um, and extends that peak flow so that the water gets to the rivers much more slowly or the water gets to the bottom of your road much more slowly. So um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the developments that's happening on Rington Lane. I don't know if you've seen that. So um, they recently started building on a field off Rington Lane. And to do so, they have removed a hedge and they've put in a road that snakes down, down a hill and joins a road at the bottom of the hill. So in the recent heavy rain that we had, it flooded at the bottom of the hill and it has never flooded at the bottom of the hill before and that is because the grass from the site has been removed the soil has been compacted and the hedge has been removed so now all the water that falls on that field um that it now just runs down into the road and collects at the bottom so the water cycle has been disrupted by that development and all of these aspects of the water cycle when they're not working relate in like I said, poor groundwater recharge. We want the water to be going into the ground. We want it to be available to plants, to crops. We don't want it to be um, going straight into the rivers or causing floods around everybody's houses. So the next cycle that we need to think about is the nutrient cycle. So this is an extremely simple representation of the nutrient cycle because the real nutrient cycle is this is so wonderfully complicated, I don't think anyone could explain it. So if we start off um, over here, we've got the plant and the animal matter. So in a very simple nutrient cycle, you've got the dead animals, the dead leaves on the soil surface, the soil microbes and all the invertebrates and things like that, break it down, break it into the soil in a way that means that it's available to plants, the plants grow, something eats the plants, they die, it goes round and round and round like that. In actual fact, it's a web rather than a, a cycle as such, um, in that there's so many different um, interrelations between what's using nutrients and, and what's sort of growing and things like that. Um, it, it's much more complicated than this. So how can we tell that the nutrient cycle is working. So basically, you will see that um, the leaf litter and things is rotting down. So if you go into the woods um, and sort of bury down through the leaves, you'll see that those leaves turn into soil fairly quickly. You don't have to go very deep before they're starting to turn into soil. Um, but if you've got lots and lots of leaf litter that isn't rotting down, those nutrients aren't cycling. So, for example, if you have um, an area of grassland that hasn't been cut for several years and it hasn't had any livestock on it or anything like that. So it hasn't had that hoof pressure pushing down those plants, getting that contact with the soil. Um, those plants won't really be rotting down in a kind of useful way. They'll just be oxidising. And um, so that's that's not what you want. You want everything to be breaking down fairly quickly. You don't have to go too deep. You'll find lots of invertebrates on the soil surface and also underground. So if you dig down, there'll be lots of worms and things like that in the soil and lots of nematodes. The other indication that your nutrient cycle is working is that dung will disappear quickly. 
Um, so you're not supposed to see frisbee cowpats that just stick around for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Those cowpats should go within a week, within a few days, if you've got lots of dung beetles, lots of fly larvae, um, you should have birds looking for food in those cow pats, you know, taking them apart, breaking them up. Dung should disappear quickly um, if you have got a, a well-functioning nutrient cycle. Um, and one of the things that can impede dung disappearing is things like um, the use of wormers um, in uh, livestock. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't worm your livestock. Obviously, if they have worms or if they have an issue, they should be treated. Absolutely, they should be treated. Um, but um, there's ways of dealing with the dung of those animals and ways of working out specifically which animals to dose and how much to dose. Because the wormer that they're getting often, it depends on the type of wormer, but often those wormers remain active in the dung after the animal has pooed them out basically. So they're still there killing invertebrates whilst they're in the poo. Um, because obviously the invertebrates that they're killing in the gut um, aren't that different to the invertebrates that you should be finding in your, in your fields. Um, so there is a whole corner of the internet devoted to dung beetles, how to encourage dung beetles. Um, so I invite you to uh, find that corner of the internet and um, investigate it in your own time. Um, but yeah, so basically round here, dung beetles are massively important because they're food for all the lovely bats that we've got around here. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's something that we really need to work to encourage. Um, other signs that your nutrient cycle is working, um, you should have a really nice crumbly soil structure. So your soil should be what's called friable. So it should sort of break up nice and easily um, and have a sort of good amount of fine roots through it. Um, and it should smell really nice as well. I don't know if you've ever dug a hole and sniffed some soil, but it should it should have a nice sort of almost sweet smell about it. Um, and the final indication uh, that nutrient cycle is working well is that you should have a good coverage of plants. So this is kind of related to the water cycle as well, and that you don't want too much bare ground. Um, you should have lots of different plants doing lots of different things with lots of types of roots and different root depths and different relationships with other plants and animals and things. You should have that good coverage there. And that shows you that your nutrients are cycling through the system really well. Um, Hello. When you watch the um, Yo Valley um, programme, I'm sure everyone will now, um, at the very beginning, they were looking at the soil because that's where it all started. Yeah. So, well, you know, to make the organic, to get the organic milk, you have yeah. to have good grazing. 60% I think has to be, um, you know, ordinary grazing. And he, um, or she showed him the, um, was it, uh, the was different it Tom? sorts. Was it Tom White doing it? No. Okay. It was, it was a female group out in the field. Okay. Um, and there was clover and then the herbal lays came in as well. You yeah. Know, so, yeah. You so know, Yo, then... Yo Valley are doing a lot of really amazing work on, on their soils and getting as much organic matter into their soils as they possibly can, yes. rotating and... the cows um, and also using kind of, they don't do single species anything, even their arable crops are different species, sort of different varieties of plants yes. together. Monoculture, yeah. not a good thing. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Even if you just add clover into a load, do not have a monoculture. Um, but yeah, no, thanks for that, Teresa. No, thank you. Um, yeah, so the other thing I want to talk about, uh, sort of make you aware, I don't know if you've joined these two things up before, but greenhouse gas emissions, so methane, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, their emissions, their sequestration, their storage, it's all part of nutrient cycling. Um, so if farms have a good nutrient management plan, then their emissions of all these should be reduced. Um, and farming in this is in quite a unique position in that, you know, like a lot of industries, it emits a lot of greenhouse gases. But also it has quite a unique opportunity in that they can also sequester and lock up a lot of um, greenhouse gases. So if we kind of have a look um, at this diagram. So this diagram is taken from the NFU because um, obviously they're encouraging um, their members to go net zero. I think their target is 2040, possibly, for them to be net zero. Um, 
But yeah, so if we look at all the red arrows, so these are all the sources of um, carbon dioxide. So you've got, you know, simply respiration from eating the food they've grown. Um, nitrous oxide is linked to um, nitrogen applications. So if you apply too much nitrogen to your soil when your plants don't need it, that goes to um, nitrous oxide in the simplest of terms. <laughs> Um, methane is obviously linked to uh, ruminants, so it varies a lot, but depending on the animal and depending on their diet, um, you can get different amounts of methane that they will emit. Um, and you've also got, um, if they're growing crops of bioenergy, that releases carbon dioxide as well. But then there's lots of ways where carbon can be stored in the system. So um, um, you can um, manage your soils in a way that builds soil organic matter. Um, and we can talk about that in a minute. You can encourage more trees onto your holding. You can have more hedges. Um, there's lots and lots of things you can do to sequester more carbon on your farm. And also there's the opportunity over here to um, use wind and solar. Um, so to sort of produce green energy and um and kind of reduce those emissions as well um and there's also things like smart farming so that is to do with just applying inputs where they're absolutely necessary and absolutely needed rather than just sort of applying it across the whole field um so it's sort of being more specific about things so um species interactions are extremely important because all these ecosystem processes that we've been talking about rely on biodiversity and the interaction of species with their environment. So this is um, a gorgeous meadow in East Mendip. So you've got loads of um, orchids there. Um, there's quite a few knapweed in the foreground that's not quite flowering yet. Um, and there's loads of, uh, I think that's cat's ear and hawk bits and things like that. It's a beautiful, beautiful meadow. Every single one of those grasses and plants has got a relationship with plenty of other plants. So for example, and they'll all be doing a different job. So they might have roots punching through compacted soil that we were talking about, or they might um, be supporting pollinators, or they might be secreting different sugars from their roots that are keeping different microbes going. They, they will all be doing something. Um, and what you often find, like I was saying earlier, is that diverse communities are more resilient. So they bounce back from from shocks better um, and they can withstand sort of environmental pressures better. So, for example, um, if you've got a really diverse grassland and it's next to a river and there's a flood, that will come back sooner than a less diverse grassland. Um, and there's loads of different reasons for this. Partly it's just because there's sort of more species so something will be fine um but also it's the conditions in the soil and the conditions there yeah, are able to rebalance themselves quicker when there's just more variety there um and often the species composition of a community can tell us what's going on so really no one species should dominate um, so, for example, if you've got a field that's full of docks, that's not quite right. <laughs> but the reason that that could be happening is often soil compaction. So docks have got very, very strong, deep tap roots. And sometimes they can be the only plants that can manage to grow there. And they outcompete a lot of the other plants um, because none of the other plants can deal with the compaction. Or you might be getting... Um, rushes or meadow sweet and that's telling you that you've got very wet conditions in your soil um so the community can kind of indicate what's what's going on um and it can sort of tell us a lot about things um and in terms of species interactions and having a really varied community succession is also important um so that's having um uh kind of successional stages so bare ground through grassland through scrub through woodland so that that sort of that's your typical successional stages in this country um but it's also important to have plants at different growth stages so if you're doing a woodland survey and you want to know um how your woodland's doing then that everything's in balance you should have trees of all different ages so you should have um 
you know, tiny little saplings, germinating seedlings. You should have kind of mid-age trees. You should have veterans. You should have some ancient trees as well. So you you should have that structure. And each one of those different growth stages will be supporting different things as well. As Teresa was saying, um, soil health is really important at Yo Valley. Um, and it's important everywhere. It's the, it's the foundation of everything. It's, a, it's this, the foundation of all the ecosystem processes that we've been talking about. Um, so these are the five principles of soil health. Um, they're laid out in a book that you might want to read called Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown. And he's kind of one of the, um, he's quite a vocal promoter of regenerative farming. Um, and he's put it all together really nicely in his Dirt to Soil book. So it's about valuing soil, basically, not just looking at it as dirt that your plants pop out of. It's it's really important. Um, and these five principles are the principles of regenerative agriculture. And I think these are these are relevant to everyone, even if you're not a farmer. If you start thinking about your garden in this way as well, um, you can really start to get those ecosystem processes going on on in your garden as well. Um, so basically, these are the five principles. So the first one limits soil disturbance. So the idea being here is that when soil is disturbed, you end up oxidizing organic matter. So that means you get carbon dioxide, basically. Um, and more and more farmers now are working out ways to reduce their soil disturbance. So some people are stopping plowing altogether. Some people are reducing how often they plow. Some people are reducing the depth of their plowing. They're doing things like planting into residues of the previous crop um, and they're experimenting with things like that. And this does help to build your, your soil organic matter. Um, covering the soil surface is important. So if you think back to what we were saying about um, uh, the water cycle and the nutrient cycle, if you've got bare soil, that means those aren't working. And if your soil is bare, then it's more vulnerable to weathering and washing away. So the rain can hit it and can cause capping or it can just get washed into the rivers. Um, so by covering the soil surface with plants, you're protecting the soil from um, rain and from sun and massive fluctuations in temperature and, and very fluctuating conditions. So covering the soil is a really good idea. Um, building diversity. So that goes back to our species interactions that we were talking about. And you can do this on a farm by using mixed crops um, or so, for example, um, having, I don't know, like peas and beans in the same cover or something like that you can and you can also um, add in clovers and herbal lays that I was talking about and like I was saying the idea here being that um, different root structures have a different effect on the soil they add different nut nutrients to the soil that's how you can approach it with plants you can also do things like add in trees um, so you might have heard people talking about agroforestry and um uh, silver pasture so that's where you have trees kind of dotted through your fields or like clumps of trees that your animals can use and graze between that has all sorts of benefits for the animals and it also has benefits for biodiversity and the thinking is that that sort of wood pasture type habitat is the kind of habitat that we had um, so it's a more naturalistic habitat and a lot of plants have kind of evolved under those conditions so um, diversity responds really well to that. It also applies to grazing animals. Um, so if you're thinking about regenerative farming, people will often have um, cows and sheep and ponies and goats and chickens all in a rotation or all using the ground together. Um, and again, that goes back to sort of trying to mimic natural conditions where you've got lots of different animals having an effect on the soil at the same time. Well, rather than kind of just one type of animal just there all the time. Um, keeping living roots in the soil. So again, you know, we've covered this a lot, but this is referring to having living roots in the soil all year round. And it's that's so that natural processes don't stop in the winter. Um, there's plenty of stuff going on under the ground in the winter. So um, 
doing things like having um bare soil through the winter is you know it's not the best it doesn't keep a lot of our natural processes going so it's not the best idea um and the final principle of soil health is to integrate animals so animals do a lot more than just eat grass so obviously they they poo and they wee and that dung helps the nutrient cycle but there's a lot of other things that they do as well just the physical action of having animals on the ground um can set off a lot of the natural processes so if you think about it they're trampling vegetation and this is absolutely key for adding soil organic matter so like i said when you've got animals trampling the vegetation they're pushing that vegetation down onto the soil and then that allows the soil microbes to get to those plants and to bring those nutrients and that organic matter into the soil and that that's a really key thing if you're thinking about sequestering as much carbon as you can into your soil. The hoof action causes small amounts of disturbance so that creates sort of little germination gaps you call them so little areas where like any wildflower seeds or anything like that can can get a chance to sort of get to the light and get and germinate so that's quite important as well. And something people often talk about is herd effect. So that's this idea that short, sharp, high impact, high animal impact kind of mimics the conditions that different plants have evolved in. So if you think about kind of the example that's often used is like big herds of buffalo and stuff moving across the Great Plains in, in America in that, you know, they're there one minute, they're trampling, they're dunging, they're chewing, they're running, you know, they're breaking up the soil and then they go. And then you get a really long period of rest and then the plants kind of bounce back from that. So in regenerative agriculture, a lot of people try and um, mimic that by doing things like mob grazing. So that's like having a lot of animals in a small area for a very short period of time and then moving them on to another bit. So a lot of people go um, down that route as well. So I wanted to just um, focus in on a couple of different habitats that we get on farms. Um, I thought I'd start off with hedges because often that can be a flashpoint between kind of farmers and the public because some hedge management looks really drastic um, and some hedges are quite badly degraded. So I thought I would sort of explain what is good hedge management in inverted commas. So basically hedges, they need to be bushy, they need to be flowery and they need to be fruity. Um, but most of all, they need to be managed. So hedges, if they're left unmanaged, can become very long, very leggy, they lose that bushy structure um, and they lose a lot of their wildlife value. Um, so they do either need to be regularly trimmed or they need to be rejuvenated through laying or through coppicing. Um, so if you think about it, when the hedges are younger, you can cut them more frequently. As they get older, they need to be trimmed every three years or so. The best time of year to do it is as far into the winter as you possibly can, because if you've been managing them nicely um, and they've got fruit on them the birds need to be able to access that fruit all the way through the winter um I know a lot of um farmers are keen to cut their hedges as soon as they're allowed to in September but any hedges that can be left kind of later should be left as late as they possibly can um obviously the bird nesting season starts in March so kind of cutting them um February is, is sort of ideal but obviously ground conditions sometimes mean that farmers have to cut them sooner um hedges will only flower and fruit on sort of older growth so any new growth from the summer um summer previously won't have flowers and won't fruit so it's sort of second year growth um onwards that they flower and fruit so when you are cutting your hedge with a flail it's a good idea to kind of leave it a little bit longer every year rather than cutting it back to the same height um and if you think about it, if you're doing, if you're cutting your hedges on a three year rotation with sort of 10 centimetres extra every year, that's only an extra metre over 30 years. So they're not going to get massive and, and uncontrollable um, too soon. I just wanted to give you an, an example of um, hedges that need rejuvenation. Um, so the hedge on the left um, has been sort of Obviously, it's been left for the last couple of years, but previously it's been cut to the same height um, over and over again. So if you see this sort of thick bit here, what you often get is like a knuckle developing on the hedge. 
Um, and that's basically a sort of stress reaction. So the hedge gets cut back to the same place every year and it sort of shoots wildly from that place to repair itself. And you lose the bushy structure at the bottom. I think there's also been a lot of sheep grazing in this hedge. Um, and eventually they be the, the, the hedge plants will um, become exhausted and they will die out and you'll get a very thin scraggy hedge like this. Um, hedges do need rejuvenation so they either need um, laying when they start to become leggy or they need to be coppiced as well that's a perfectly justified way of managing hedges um, I know for some farmers that have coppiced their hedges have come in for a lot of flack um, because people think they've just cut the hedge down and that's that but um, what will actually happen is the hedges will sort of shoot up nicely from the base um, so that's a way of sort of rejuvenating them. In terms of laying, it doesn't always have to be a fancy midland hedge like this. So this is a hedge that was laid for a competition, um, but you could just as easily rejuvenate a hedge by cutting it and just lying it straight down. I often see that in Somerset. Um, basically, the idea is that you create some sort of sort of horizontal structure to the hedge so it's stop proof and you create some kind of damage to the bottom of the hedge plants um, so that they sort of shoot up and put on more bushy growth. Um, but yeah, so there, there's sort of different ways of rejuvenating hedges, but they do need rejuvenation eventually. So because a hedge, a hedge isn't a natural thing. It's a completely man made situation. So they do need some work on them. Um, the other sorts of habitat that I wanted to talk about are grasslands. So um, grasslands are essentially, well, they're sort of my favourite habitat and I could talk about grasslands forever and ever and ever. Um, but I thought it would also be um, relevant to you guys. Often when I speak to community groups, um, because it's often possible for community groups to make meadows or to make meadows in their own gardens, often I get a lot of questions about grasslands. So I thought you might like to hear a few bits um about them and, and grasslands are a great way of building soil organic matter um because the grass the roots of grassland species are so varied um you know grass roots can go down for at least a meter into the soil you get some really deep rooting grasses like coxfoot and things like that that um are amazing at, at going down right into the soil and the deeper down those roots go the more soil organic matter that you're accumulating um so I'm going to focus on sort of two types of grass and I'm not really going to talk about grass lays or um, groups of uh, cornfield annuals, which you often see in like public um, planting, um, because I sort of in my head, I think of them as more of a crop um, than a, a habitat as such, like a long term habitat. Um, so what makes a meadow? So meadows, obviously, they're not just flowers. The grasses are important too. Um, grasses are massively important in terms of the ecology of the grassland and how they flower and what their roots do and things so it's important if you're planting a meadow to include like decent grass species in there as well so the finer grasses like the fescues and the coxfoot um and so those need to be included um grasslands are like i said they're undisturbed um typical meadow management is to allow them to grow long um and then to cut during july or august um so leave them as late as you dare before you cut them because you want the plants to be going to seed um, when you cut them for hay so that the grass, so that the seeds drop onto the soil as you're drying it. Um, and then obviously they can germinate and continue um, to have wildflowers and grasses the following year. Um, and what you can do is you can do something called aftermath grazing um, after you've cut them. So uh, through the autumn while the grass is growing um, and also kind of coming when you get that flush of grass in the spring, it's good to graze that off for the meadow as well. Um, so the other type of grass and I just wanted to mention was pasture. Um, so pastures are often much more diverse than meadows. So basically mowing a meadow is a it's a catastrophic event basically <laughs> you know it's fine meadow management is fine you get very diverse meadows but if you're cutting that meadow at the same time every year there's going to be a whole lot of species that haven't gone to seed um or were halfway through their life cycle and then and then they got cut down so for example um uh, meadow browns and skippers those butterflies um their caterpillars tend to sort of 
be in the grasses a lot later into the um into the summer um and so if you're sort of cutting earlier in the year for hay you can cut those life cycles short but pasture is managed primarily through grazing so often um this is one of the somerset wildlife trust reserves and you can see that it's it's totally impossible to mow that so often they're quite varied sites to start with but by managing them through grazing and this is sort of quite light grazing um the animals themselves create a really varied sward structure so you get bits of scrub you get tussocks you get ant hills because you don't get ant hills in meadows because they get knocked down when you do the hay cut um yeah and you get scrub and you get short areas uh, so it's actually very varied because each of those different types of grass is uh, a lovely little micro habitat so they are um they are very diverse and you get species that specialize in short grass habitat so for example if you're thinking about your gardens um you'll get things like um blackbirds and thrushes and stuff foraging in the shorter grass areas if you're thinking of doing like a meadow in your garden it's a good idea to leave shorter areas as well because the the birds do prefer to forage in those shorter areas and um, wax cap fungi and uh, solitary bees like quite a short grass but then conversely um there's lots of different wildlife that like that longer tussocky grass as well so it's good to have um that variation there too if you can and if you've got areas that can be left long for you know a couple of years and then mown after two summers um that's really good as well because you find that bumblebees tend to nest in those sort of more established tussocks um yeah so that's just a few things about pasture yeah so finally i just wanted to kind of wrap up with a bit of a, a tour around a potentially nature friendly farm so as i said every farm is different and um you know it's very unlikely that anyone can do all of these things on their farm but i thought this is quite a nice um diagram from the nature friendly farming network um, and i recommend having a look on their website because they've got some really good resources in terms of um you know understanding farming good ideas for farmers uh, for things that they can do on their farms good management plans like management plant templates and things like that and um, so it's worth having a look so if we just start off um up here so this is a little box with ideas about wetland wetlands um so buffering and creating new wetlands is a really good idea so today i went to um, a natural flood management workshop and then we're talking about um, stage zero rivers. So what we've ended up with, because we live in such a heavily modified land landscape, is our rivers are really restricted. They're restricted to kind of single channels that become really incised, um, or sometimes they're essentially drainage channels like the Yo at Kongsbury, um, and there's no meanders, there's no woody debris, there's nothing like that. But rivers used to be a kind of system of, braided channels that would sort of I saw a really nice animation once that was had a wetland like a lung that was sort of filling and emptying according to kind of rainfall and things like that so rivers used to look a lot different and they used to have a lot more space so anything if you've got a river on your farm or any sort of wetland feature give it as much space as you possibly can um and also do the things that we've been talking about um, to improve the water cycle and to improve the nutrient cycle and to improve your soil structure. And then you'll get more groundwater recharge as well. Um, moving around to here, um, you can use uh, a nutrient management plan. So that means that you're only applying nutrients where they're absolutely needed. So that reduces your emissions. Um, it reduces the cost of your inputs. Um, and it reduces any sort of runoff or pollution into the watercourses as well, because obviously high nutrient levels can um, act as a pollutant. Um, and do what you can to encourage microbial activity in the soil. So often that includes using organic manures um, or um, particular additives to the soil. Something else that can be done in nature friendly farming is using um, cover crops cover crops or catch crops and green manures so that's planting things that aren't necessarily a crop as such but they have a function of either catching any excess nutrients or um adding nutrients to the soil if they've got legumes or something like that or they can just be cover over the winter so like we've been saying about um protecting the soil they can they can purely have a protective um role for the soil 
Um, other things that you can do, we've talked about reducing soil disturbance. So that's sort of less ploughing, shallower ploughing, no ploughing. Um, that's one thing you can do and you can plant more diverse crops. Um, like I said, using the different root structures of plants, using the different roles that those plants play under the ground is quite a good way of, of improving your soil structure. Another thing you can do is to have different habitats around the farm. So I often say to farmers, if you do one thing, just vary the vegetation structure as much as you can. And having those different variations in vegetation structure running through the farm will create corridors and will join up different part, different areas on your farm. And you'll notice that the wildlife is moving around your farm much more easily. Um, and you can encourage what they call beneficial insects. So that's uh, pollinators. It's things like spiders and ground beetles that will predate on crop pests. It's that kind of thing. So those are beneficial insects. Um, and you can encourage those on your farm by having those year round habitats. So it's not just thinking about having loads of flowers in the summer and then nowhere for invertebrates to overwinter or not providing any kind of nest sites. So it's like I was saying about having areas of rough grass and that aren't cut for kind of two years or so um, to provide that shelter um, outside of the summer months. Other things that are a good idea to do is to make a plan for the whole farm. Um, including things like uh, any sort of climate adaptation that you might want to do. So things like if we're going to have droughty periods, how can we recharge our groundwater or should we be using different plants in our lays that can deal with drought and that kind of thing? And also thinking about biodiversity targets. So it's a good idea to talk to kind of local advisors who know what's important for your area. Sometimes there's particular funding available if you're going to focus on particular actions on your farm. Um, often that's through water companies, things like that. So it's a good idea to kind of look at the farm as a whole unit and make plans in that way. Um, other things you can do are um, graze in a way that makes the most of animal impact. Um, so that's what I was saying about thinking about um, trampling and all the different behaviors that your stock do and how they interact with the landscape um, and that will improve your soil health as well um, and then other things are obviously actively manage your hedges and um, so manage them in a way that makes them uh, bushy and vibrant and full of flowers in the springtime and um, full of fruit in the autumn and the winter and incorporate more trees onto the farm so as I was saying earlier Trees don't just go in hedges. I think if you want to get diversity into your fields, into the centre of fields, um, you need to be bringing trees into the fields as well. You need to be sort of, rather than having all the habitat around the edge, you need to be thinking about how you can encourage things into the centre of the fields. And incorporating trees into your holding um, is a great way of doing that so it's not necessarily having big blocks of trees go for big planting schemes it's just you know a few extra in field trees um is a really good way of doing that so that's it from me um are there any questions from anybody any have i piqued your interest or made a terrible error that you want to correct <laughs> thank you ellie uh, it's really meaty talk, really good stuff. Oh, it, I, yes, I didn't know if it was too meaty. I wasn't sure. No, I, I, I uh, you know, I've got lots of things I could say. Let's see. If, um, uh, I know we, we've got at least two farmers here. Oh, I know. Good. Um, uh, so, any some questions? Can anyone like to make some questions or even observations? Can we spring Slide in my first. ear. Yeah, Should go on then. You, you spoke at the very beginning, you were talking about phosphate pollution. Yeah. Um, we, we've been um, uh, seeing Natural England mm. do water sampling on the Triple SI, where mm. our land is, and you know, where we manage our greens. That's Coms. And uh, you were talking about, um, you know, um, uh, under a new scheme potential for. Yes, you were talking about people that farmers could be paid perhaps um, in the future for reducing the, the amount of phosphate 
that they're releasing into the water. Um, because the water quality in our triple SIs around here isn't great. And we now know that, but what, what interested me was their water guy said, we could be looking at the effects of, um, of fertilizer applications from up to 30 years ago. And I was just wondering how that works <laughs> if you pay farmers to reduce the amount they're putting on the land but the pollution isn't necessarily going to reduce, is it? Yeah, it's it's really complicated. Because, and I think the thing is with phosphates is that, so phosphates and nitrates behave in a different way in the environment. So nitrates are soluble. So if you apply them to a field and it rains, you know, they, they can get washed out easily and get washed into the water course. It's, it's a much more instant thing. Whereas phosphates will bind to soil particles so they hang around for a lot longer they're a lot harder to strip out of um water and things like that so mm. i think one of the things that can be done is to reduce soil washing into the rivers that's one thing that can be done to kind of reduce extra pollutants um, but there's lots of research being done in, in terms of like, how can you actually strip out the phosphates from water? So you can do things like um, you can grow phragmites, like you grow reeds and things like that and have sort of tiers of water purification. But there's so in terms of the nutrient neutrality, um, it's a case of identifying land in particular places in the river catchment um, where you can kind of mop up those phosphates so even though the the ditches and things around here might be high in phosphates it's not here where you need to do the work it might be further further up yeah. the catchment, somewhere yeah. else in the catchment and also there's issues through um like water treatment works as well um so you know sometimes there's discharges into rivers and things like that when you know there's been storm surges or whatever and so there's a it's a very complicated issue in terms of identifying the source and solving that yeah sure but i'm all i'm i'm reading all the time about um you know the the idea that uh water should be released more slowly um you know from from farmland mm. um and you know to a bit give a chance for it to soak in slowly and so on. And, yeah, and, and it's also things like, um, so I went to see Natural Flood Management thing today and what they had done is they'd done things like lowered the banks in some areas. So they created kind of washlands. And so a lot yeah. of the sediment that was in the water could drop out because the water sort of goes to these areas, slows down. It's not carrying as much sediment. The sediment drops out and the water kind of gently flows back down the the stream and things like that so it's it's about because if you've got rivers that are designed to shift as much water as quickly yeah. as possible they're gonna have a lot of energy in them so they're going to carry a lot of sediment and they're also going to gouge out their channel as well there'll be a lot more erosion um and and that will add to the soil that's in the water and that soil's got phosphates bound to it so it's there's a lot of different aspects to to sort of reducing the pollution of of rivers in terms of sort of phosphates and nitrates and things and i think it's very important to say that it's not just it's not just from farms that's not the only source of of these pollutants you know there's domestic sources i mean so for example in somerset there's a sort of moratorium on development unless you can prove that your development isn't going to contribute any more phosphates to the Ramsar sites and you know Bridgewater Bay and things like that. So, yeah, there's there's some quite quite sort of serious um, policies and things around whether you can prove whether your development is going to harm designated sites with the amount of phosphates it will re release. Okay, it just seems to me we're still so obsessed, or well, the Internal Drainage Board in this area is so obsessed with um, making all the channels very straight and very deep and mm. taking water away as quickly as possible. And yeah. everything I read suggests that that is contrary to common sense. Yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 very, very complicated. And also it's about sort of changing um, 
long held views as well. And, you know, unless there's unless there's like the right support in place nobody wants to be that farmer whose fields are flooded in the summer like no nobody wants that to happen um mm. so you know that's that's a difficulty you know winter flooding is one thing but summer flooding in terms of farming is a whole different level of catastrophe um and so unless there's decent remuneration for doing that nobody's going to want to do that um so it's it's a very difficult thing to to manage. Any anyone else would like to ask a question? We've got what I've got. Ah, this one Margaret? says Margaret. Margaret. Um, yeah. Hi, Eleanor. Um, do you mind if I ask you to backtrack to something when you were talking about the five principles of soil? health yes yes well, um, I, I kind of got lost on the last one it, thinking of gut in a garden <laughs> um well uh what was the last one it was animals wasn't it it was integrating integrating animals. animals yeah well I mean I don't it depends how big your garden is but perhaps you can't <laughs> do that one so the idea with that one is that um animals are obviously part of ecosystems naturally hmm. and it's about looking at how an animal physically interacts with the area that it's grazing and how that can kind of kick start um different processes um so i guess i don't know i mean i guess you could you know create some germination gaps in your lawn by sort of attacking it a bit with a hoe or scraping it with a rake or i guess you could kind of trample different bits um but yeah, that is, I mean, to be fair, that is harder to apply in a garden. Yeah, Maybe I, I just got a bit lost on that one. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I'm kind of thinking about um, the cat's feces on the borders and things. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, canine, well, omnivores are kind of harder for that. But and also they're probably quite heavily wormed as well. So maybe they're not the best. Mm. <laughs> not got the best yeah. garden. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, it's one there, Graham. Um, hi, Ali. Um, hi. I'm interested in your opinion on the diversification of farming, mm -hmm. which, which can include potentially the use of solar panels uh, on farms, only as part of the farm. Um, but obviously, there the solar panels are installed, uh, the pasture land, or is now meadowland, is enhanced, and the hedgerows enriched because it seems to provide a, an alternative solution to the farming situation. Rather than selling the land from a, a housing development to move it into a slightly different area, but it's obviously got implications on the farming and the biodiversity in that area. Have you got any opinions on that? Yeah, it's. I mean, for starters, land use planning it needs to be done at a high level in terms of what goes where because there are so many different demands on land at the moment so you've got housing you've got carbon sequestration you've got um energy generation you've got all of these things that need to happen on land so i think there needs to be a more strategic view of what should go where um with solar panels i've seen it on farms it is possible to farm around them you know it's possible to graze around them often with the schemes you do end up with a more diverse grass mix going in underneath them um you know I've seen situations where the field with the solar panels is much more diverse than the field next door that doesn't have solar panels um so I think it's about how it's done I also think that um you know there's lots of places where we could put solar panels so for example on the roofs of new houses would be a good place to put solar panels or you know on the sheds of big shopping centers so there's lots of different places that you could put solar panels um to be honest but i don't i don't feel that it's as i mean this is my personal view but i don't feel that it's as damaging as some people feel that it is i think there's a lot you can do around them yeah, the reason I asked the question is because that's an area that our son's involved in. Mm. Um, so he's heavily involved in this. And you hear this, a different type of story when people, the people that are involved in it, whereas mm. a lot of the public just perceive it as a, 
a sort of decimation of the landscape and they just see the solar panels without yeah. but that. I think I think there's this sort of goes back to sort of being a people being able to read the landscape and ecological literacy <laughs> I, I, I think there's a lot of issues with the, the assumption that because it's green it's all right and I, I think people see the solar panels and they're, you know, they're immediately triggered by that, but they, they don't seem to mind that there's a field with just rye grass in it next door and nothing else. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of learning to be done, definitely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else with a question? Hi, Stan. Hello. Hi, Dan. <laughs> hey, Ellie, that was, that was great. Really comprehensive and oh. that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I do have a question actually. Um, you said about um, different habitats around the farm and different vegetation structures. Yeah. Um, other than kind of planting trees in the middle of the fields, have you got any other good examples to? Um, so there's, uh, I guess it's to do with things like allowing patches of scrub to develop, you know, maybe in less productive areas or allowing hedges to spread out a bit more. There's um, sort of trees around the farm agroforestry. Those are good ideas, although perhaps not if you're on peat. <laughs> um not the best um but it's also things like uh leaving areas of uh rough grass as well so like having areas that again you you're leaving for sort of two summers and then you let the stock on them after that it's it's that kind of thing just getting as much mm. diversity as you can um so it doesn't you don't have to be creating kind of top draw species rich habitat to be having a benefit and um, so I guess that's kind of the messaging and it, it varies from farm to farm it's about kind of looking around and and thinking about what you could just give a bit space to I think oh uh, great thank you uh, it's uh, Joe hi oh Joe hi you. um thank you Ellie yeah that was that was great um okay. also yeah very yeah you covered on, on some really good stuff there um yeah, I did mention earlier because I couldn't unmute my computer fast enough, but like I come from a farming family as well. Oh, um, yeah, just I think we, yeah, we virtually our farms like virtually organic. I say the only thing that doesn't make it organic is probably the wormers, mm -hmm. but that's about it. So it's all it's all grass fed uh, beef and sheep mostly. And it's only a small farm, though. So I'm just I'm think I'm always looking at ways because I feel we manage it in the correct way. I'm just always I'm always looking at like ways that maybe we can capitalize to capitalize on that as well uh -huh. um and then I'm also working as an ecologist at the moment so I've got B and G like in my head like all the time but yeah yeah because yeah. I, I did try to apply for um the grant schemes and stuff but a lot of them turned me away because the farm was too small if you know what I mean oh okay so they you said it just it, that, yeah that can be an issue I, th I think some I think this is where private finance is really going to start to come in, in that sometimes the grant schemes are difficult to apply for or um, they're not necessarily applicable to everyone. And I think that's where kind of the smaller farms can be more creative in terms of the income that they can generate and what they can use their land for. Yeah, yeah. I think also with BNG, there's there's depending on what habitat you're creating you can still farm it so if if you've got to create species rich grassland or something like that you know you you can that can still be farmed so it's not you're not losing that land for food production and things so i think there's still quite a few options in that respect yeah definitely yeah, yeah. and it's it's like i guess it's like because like so, so even if the habitats on the farm are, are good as as they are Mm. it's it's whether there's room for improvement isn't there so yeah and I think I think like in that situation <clears throat> sometimes it's worth looking at how you can work with your neighbors so for example with the new land management schemes that are coming in so you've got the sustainable farming incentive that's at the bottom but the the new sort of middle layer I think there is going to be a greater emphasis on collaboration and things like that so putting in joint applications and so if what you've got on your farm is already Sort of nice and diverse it's you know join up with your neighbors share ideas create habitats over a larger scale and that's you know that's kind of the next step really i think sometimes yeah yeah sounds good brilliant thanks do you ellie do you think that the we've heard a lot in the same way that we've heard a lot all about 
um, um, elms and you know everybody was getting very excited mm -hmm. a lot of things seemed to have cooled down a lot and um, <clears throat> I went to quite a few seminars on the nature recovery network which was meant to be something that was really a bit of glue to hold um, the practical working of the environment bill through so in terms of land management do you think the, the whole idea is uh, reportedly is, is meant to be about the whole everybody who's got an in, uh, an interest in land so that could be uh, the consumers it could be the you know farming interests it could be other types of land owning interests it could be businesses and everything else all putting money into the pot to actually improve uh, nature um and do you think this could be a, a the the way in which pe people could get together in terms to and this could be underpinned by collaborative moves because we, we've seen some tr tremendous schemes going on over i know in east anglia for example where landowners ju just got together and they tend to be the big the big people but it, it's all about uh, smaller groups community groups also adding into that and getting together so are we going to see anything you know, about the nature recovery network are you aware of anything yes yeah, so going on certainly in somerset um the local nature partnership is involved in writing a local nature recovery strategy um and that will include a nature recovery network and it and it will be something that pulls together all these efforts um and i know that the wildlife trusts have an initiative called team wilder and that is designed for community groups um schools individuals that want to do things in their local community so that's all about community enabling so that's a focus for different efforts as well um but yeah i, I do think that the nature recovery network it will be done on a sort of county by county basis mm -hmm. um but i do think that that will be useful when it's finally pulled together i mean it's a huge job to pull together yeah yeah <laughs> and it you know it requires yeah. all sorts of modeling and and consultation and all kinds of things um but yeah i, I do think and i think it's i think it's very much needed because like i was saying there's so many different demands on land at the moment um I think it's I think it's really necessary and also there's lots of different opportunities to kind of stack different schemes and things like that so you might be able to do carbon credits and biodiversity net gain at the same time or there might be particular pieces of land that are you know would be a, an amazing place for doing a nutrient neutrality project and you, you know you have to look at everything quite strategically I think so mm. there's there's lots of different options for things mm. um just trying to decide <laughs> it, well it is really it is really I, th I think it's quite incredible that it's taken a long time for people to get used to this idea uh, particularly about inputs on the land i remember speaking to a farmer who farmed up in tickenham about 10 years ago might be even longer than that and uh, we were having a conversation and he said um he was um talking about all the big giants he meant you know that Monsanto people who are making money out of inputs on the land and he said I, I gave up he said he said uh, a salesman used to come around every year and say well if you put these inputs on you'll get so much more and so so what he discovered he said quite these are the sums he said so it was he was right he said I used to spend six thousand pounds a year and I got six thousand pounds worth back for it, but I might as well have not bothered, and I haven't any more because he still makes a living. <laughs> well, that's what costs, I was saying about his the, costs are reduced. Yeah, yeah the, the the move away. So there was a very much a focus on yield, like you say, you put these things on, and you'll get so many tons per hectare or per acre. Then I suppose, but um, and but now people are waking up to it, and the, you know I don't. Firstly, I don't have that money to spend up front. <laughs> yeah. And secondly, you know, I, I don't want to spend that money. Um, and it's also about thinking about what those inputs are doing in the long term as well. Like I was saying, you've not just got to think about, you know, the next few years harvest. You've got to think about the next 50 years, the next 100 years. And mm. yeah, and I think a lot of 
people are coming around to the idea that a sustainable business is environmentally sustainable and by doing different things on your farm there's going to be all sorts of indirect benefits of doing that one thing um you know you might not necessarily get an instant financial benefit for i don't know slowing the flow of water across your land but in the long run you'll be main you'll be keeping soil on your farm and you need <laughs> soil <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so it's about kind of looking at the whole the whole picture and I think there is sort of a cultural change happening in farming as the generations move on and new people coming farming is a lot more open to new entrants now um and so I think there is a there is a real seed change happening yeah yeah that's good there used to be an old adage uh variety is the spice of life and I think that sort of sums up lots of elements of your presentation yeah. um you know that that's what is essential um uh, are there any other questions at, at all there i think we've uh, remind me yeah no you're all right. yeah <laughs> eleanor i wonder if you're aware of any uh, surveys done on land underneath solar farms uh, I can't sort of do casual surveys because, of course, they've all got big wire fences and uh, are well locked up. But uh, I know there's a pair of little owls on uh, on one of the solar farms near here, and that suggests to me that the biodiversity of the land under the solar farm is uh, is reasonably good. Yeah. <laughs> so I I don't I only have anecdotal evidence, mm. so just of me, you know, going around farms and things like that. So I haven't done any. I don't know of any papers or any sort of proper rigorous surveys. It's, it's purely from personal experience and sort of being involved in uh, sort of planning applications and, and management plans for after the solar panels have gone in and things like that. So, yeah, that that's all I know. But generally, and I see people grazing around them and, yeah, I see them fitting into a farming system rather than excluding farming from from that land. Thanks, thanks for that, Trevor. Well, um, I think it's it's getting getting to uh, the time we agreed at the end, <laughs> at the beginning. Um, thank you all for listening, and thanks for your questions and your interest. It's good. Well, uh, thank you too. Oh, I mean, it's it's been really. You've explained it all there, and um, uh, if we can't remember it all, we we will have it um, on the website, so you can go back. I thought it was absolutely. Comprehensive and brilliant, and I uh, would like to thank you very much. Oh, you're um, welcome. Anyway. Either put up a, a electronic hand or give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you yeah. very much, Ellen. Thanks very brilliant. much. Brilliant. You're and, welcome. Uh, brilliant uh, talk. Thank you. Just, yeah, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. So, everybody, there's a lot to think about there, and um, we'll. Uh, uh, the, the one thing is we, we've got some interesting fields and if you do see we will be doing some walks through our land and I think having heard this talk um, I hope it will give you um, inspired eyes for sort of studying what's coming out of the soil um, on, on those fields it's all my, different. My goal was to, to get you all reading the landscape yeah and that's what I want you all to do. I want you to be walking around and looking and thinking, is the nutrient cycler working here? How's the water cycle yeah, that's doing? It. Yeah. How many yeah. types of leaves can I see on the ground in front yeah. of me? I, that's what you need to be thinking yeah. in order to assess whether the farm that you're walking around is nature friendly or not. Thank you. That's a great message to end on. Thank you all for coming along. All right. We'll see you all again soon. Thanks very much. Thanks for Thanks, having Ellie. me. Thanks, Ellie. All right. Thank bye. You. Bye. 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 Bye.